Welcome to the next video. In this one, we're looking at a portrait of Queen Elizabeth I painted by Quentin Metzis or Massey's the Younger, circa 1583. It's known as one of the sieve portraits where Elizabeth is seen holding a sieve associating her with the Roman Vestal Virgin Tuccia, who proved her chastity by carrying water in a sieve from the River Tiber to Vestus Temple. A number of sieve portraits were made celebrating Elizabeth's virginity and may have been a response to the possible marriage between Queen Elizabeth and Francis, Duke of Anjou and Alençon. Negotiations for the marriage began in the late 1570s and even though her subjects wanted Elizabeth to marry, Francis was French and therefore a foreigner so there were many who opposed the union. A leading opponent of the marriage was Sir Christopher Hatton, and scholars think he may have had this sieve portrait made to signify the work he'd put into promoting this opposition. Hatton was a favorite courtier of Elizabeth's and became Lord Chancellor a few years after the painting, but several years before then, he'd been captain of the yeomen of the Queen's Guard, and he's depicted in the gathering of gentlemen in the background. John Dee was also a friend of Christopher Hatton and dedicated to him his 1577 publication, General and Rare Memorials Pertaining to the Perfect Art of Navigation. In the text is a beautiful illustration of Hatton's family arms, and in the sieve portrait we can see the golden hind from his heraldic crest on his cloak. Another favorite courtier of Elizabeth's was Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford and some scholars believe De Vere and Hatton were enemies. Others say that the relationship was more of a friendly rivalry for the affections of the Queen. If you've been following these videos, you know I learned from Alexander Waugh's videos that a number used to identify Edward De Vere is 1740. And the reason I've taken interest in this one sieve portrait is because I may have found 1740 concealed within it a few times, possibly hinting at the rivalry between Oxford and Hatton. The first thing that got my attention was this inscription. The words are from a poem by Italian scholar and poet Petrarch. It's a little misspelled and should read Stancho Reposo e Reposato Fano, Italian meaning weary I am and having rested still am weary. What caught my attention is the way it's been edited. Each of the first four lines ends with the letter O. Beneath the fourth O is a character that looks like a tilde, the curvy line partially over the letter A. The thing is, the inscription is in Italian, and from what I've read, a tilde over a letter A is not Italian, but Portuguese, so what's it doing here? It's not set directly over the letter A, and if it's supposed to be an accent, then why is the line curved like a tilde? If you know what this character is and what it's doing here, please let me know in the comments. In the same inscription on the 1579 George Gower Civ portrait, there are no additional characters like accents or tildes, so here's what I think's going on. In part one of his video, Where is Shakespeare Really Buried?, Alexander Waugh shows a 1740 code found in the first folio at the end of Hamlet. Hamlet is believed by Oxfordians to be the most autobiographical of the De Vere Shakespeare plays, and the last thing Hamlet says before he dies is, the rest is silence, followed by four O's, then dies. Law explains how the rest is silence, period, is 17 characters, and that the four O's, or four O, stands for 40. So hidden within the last words Hamlet says is, 1740 dies. I think we have something similar here. The words are set up like a math problem, with the tilde functioning as a kind of equal to line and letting us know where the adding stops. Like we just saw with the line from Hamlet, the four letter O's add up to 4 O, meaning 40. And when all the characters before the four letter O's are added up, there are 17. The second letter of the first word, stacho, which should be stancho, is actually two characters, a T and an A. In total, there are five characters on the first line, followed by another five, then four, then three. Altogether, they total 17. If the first word had been spelled properly as stancho, the count would instead be 18. 
someone watching this might say that the reason the artist left the N out of the first word is because fabric from the dress's veil didn't leave enough room. However, he could have just shifted everything a little lower, reduced the size of the letters, and the inscription would fit fine. You can see here, beneath the globe on the right, there are letters painted half the size, so the edges of the fabric or lack of space is not a problem. It looks to me that the words have been spelled and broken up into 17 characters and 4 O's so that Oxford's number, 1740, could be found within the inscription. And the tilde, or whatever character it is, is there to let us know where the counting ends. That leaves the last word, afano, broken up into two sets of letters, afa and no, spelled with two ends. Now even though I think 1740 may be hidden in the words above, I'm not really sure what this last part might mean, or if it means anything at all. Notice how the words above it, riposato, is spelled with a small hyphen, but even though afano is a single word, there isn't one. So maybe we're supposed to read this as two separate words. I know in Enochian, Afa means nothing or empty and that the language was being transmitted to John Dee and Edward Kelly around this time, but I don't think it's being used here. The painting is celebrating Elizabeth's chastity. I've mentioned before that I think some Europeans could have been familiar with the occasional word in Arabic, and you can find articles online about the language in Europe during the Renaissance. I did a search and found out that in Arabic, Afa means chaste. In the inscription, Afa is followed by the word no spelled with two N's. No means not in any degree or not at all. If Oxford and Elizabeth had been in a relationship, could he be contradicting the portrait's message about her chastity by saying that she was actually not chaste? Is the inscription broken up this way to conceal Oxford's number and a message about the Queen? If you have any suggestions about what the last two words might mean, please leave a comment. Now I want to turn attention to the background of the portrait. I scrolled through all the paintings of Elizabeth I could find on the web and noticed that background scenes like this aren't very common. There's the Armada portrait with ships in the background, the procession portrait with men carrying Elizabeth, but if you go online and look at all of her paintings, which are many, you'll see that a scene like this is rare. First, we're going to look at the two courtiers standing right behind her. In paintings, Elizabeth sometimes wore red, yellow, and black, like her father, Henry VIII, and like the two men here. One man is in red, a color also known as ghouls. The other is in yellow or gold, also known as ore, and he's wearing a black cloak, partially folded over itself. Ghouls and ore were also Oxford's family colors. You can see them being worn here in this portrait of Edward de Vere's daughter Susan and her family. These are also the colors of the Brotherhood of the Golden and Rosy Cross. Now what I really want to focus on is body position. In one of his videos, Wa points out the way this statue of William Shakespeare is standing. When it's reversed or seen from behind, Shakespeare is positioned into the Greek letters Rho and Chi, or R and X, which makes a Chi Rho or Cairo symbol. Now check it out. If we follow the body positions of the two courtiers standing behind Elizabeth, the arm and body of the man in red makes a 1 and a 7, or 17. The man in gold has his hand on his hip, bending his arm into a 4. So there's 17 and 4. What's left is the man in gold's right arm extending outwards, which lines up with the ruff along the collar. This line forms the cross arm of a letter T. The cloak hanging from his shoulder is folded over so that its black exterior color makes a straight line downwards, forming the base of the T. Compare the images. Is there a 17-4-T pattern concealed in the way the courtiers are standing, or is this pareidolia, where a meaningful image is being seen in what's actually just an ambiguous pattern? To me it looks like the man in red is bending his arm and leaning back, so that his arm and body make a 1 and a 7, 
and coincidentally the man in gold is bending one arm into a four and extending the other causing the cloak to fall just right so that the black revealed is a distinct vertical line perpendicular to the ruff and the arm being held out. If it is pareidolia, then what do we make of this? At first the legs of the men in red and gold appear to be going in the direction of making a letter M, which is a gesture sometimes found in Renaissance art. However, compare it to the M being made by the two young men wearing ghouls and ore in the Susan Devere portrait and you'll see a difference. Their feet and ankles are joined together, whereas the feet and ankles of the men behind Elizabeth separate and instead of an M are making two upside down V's. If that's the case, there might be something more going on. Now in order for this to actually be two letter V's, they need to be turned right side up. I know this looks kind of odd for the moment, but when we rotate the painting, notice that the legs of the page, Christopher Hatton, and the courtiers in red and gold line up, making a V, two ones, and two Vs. In Roman numerals, V11 is 7, and I've shown many times before how the Latin alphabet gematria value of V is equal to 20 and two Vs equal 40. Right now it looks like the number 740 is being incorporated into the painting. In the way that 1740 is believed to be Edward de Vere's Earl encode number, in other videos I've suggested that 740 would be his king encode number as Edward the Seventh. However, I think here there's something else we can take into account. From the background to the foreground there are ten columns. The ninth doesn't appear to be part of the colonnade, but it's just behind the tenth column to its left. Columns and legs are similar in that they both support the anatomies or structures they stand beneath. The tenth column, which is nearest to the foreground, happens to line up right next to Christopher Hatton and cast a shadow on his leg that's also nearest to the foreground. Is this a hint to add the number of columns to the numbers Christopher Hatton and the page's legs are making? Again, in Roman numerals, V11 is 7 and the gematria value of 2 Vs equal 40. From the background to the foreground, the page and Hatton make a 7. Also from the background to the foreground, there are 10 columns with the 10th lining up next to Hatton and casting a shadow on his leg. If we add the number of columns to the numbers being made by Hatton and the page, we get 17. The men in red and gold are making 2 Vs equaling 40. Altogether, from the background to the foreground, the legs, which includes the columns, add up to 1740. As far as the guards furthest in the background go, there's a lot of empty space between them and the page, and they're not making any kind of discernible number. The page, Hatton, and the courtiers in red and gold are standing in close proximity to each other, separated from the guards in the background. As far as I can tell, there's nothing else in the scene that's meant to be added. If all this is correct, that would be three times 1740 appears in the portrait. Elizabeth sometimes wore red, gold, and black, but ghouls and ore were also Oxford's colors. If the men wearing ghouls and ore are making a 1740T, and the legs also add up to 1740, then what is the message being conveyed? The two courtiers in red and gold are standing in between Queen Elizabeth and Christopher Hatton. So are they positioned into a 1740 pose to symbolize that it was Edward de Vere who got in between Christopher Hatton and the Queen? And are the legs adding up to 1740 as a hint that Hatton is following behind and treading where de Vere has already been, with his progress towards Elizabeth blocked. Oxford's number can be found within the inscription. Is it also hidden within the gestures of the men in the background, similar to how the Shakespeare statue at Westminster's is positioned into a Cairo symbol? If so, is this an indication of the rivalry between Christopher Hatton and Edward de Vere? telling us that de Vere got in between Hatton and the Queen 
and impeded his advancement towards her. If the 1740 messages are legitimate, I can only speculate on how they could have gotten included in the painting. De Vere had been banished from court around the time or not long after the marriage negotiations between Elizabeth and Francis ended, and he returned to court in 1583, the same year attributed to the portrait. I'm not suggesting that De Vere was the actual patron, though I have wondered if that's possible, but could he have met or known through familiar channels the artist Quentin Massey's, who had been living in London during that time, and had him incorporate the messages? The rivalry was occurring around ten years before the portrait is believed to have been painted, which I think is interesting because around that time, or not long after, Henry Rosley was born, 1573 according to history, or 1574, if you believe like I do, that Rosley was the son of Queen Elizabeth. In video 56 and its addendum, I'm absolutely certain I found messages in the two most noble Henry's portrait that tell us the 18th Earl of Oxford was illegitimate and that Rosalie was a king and a tutor. Please see both videos for details because there's a small but important update to the message explained in the initial video. To be clear, I don't have the same conviction regarding what I explained about the Queen Elizabeth Civ portrait as I do the two Henry's portrait, where I'm 100% confident that the message about Rosalie is legitimate. But scholars say there was a rivalry, friendly or not, between Oxford and Hatton and they agree that's Hatton in the background. What then are the odds that Oxford's number 1740 can be found in the inscription and in the way the men in the background are standing, which includes men wearing colors Elizabeth sometimes wore, but were also Oxford's family colors, red and gold? Is there nothing to see here, or was Edward de Vere taking a shot at his old rival and undermining the Civ Portrait's message of Elizabeth's chastity? If you have any questions or suggestions, let me know in the comments. And if you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. Thanks.